iOS 16 is officially here, and if I had to pick a one word theme for it, I would say customization. This video is sponsored by PDF Expert. Let's get into iOS 16. The highlight feature of iOS 16 is the customizable lock screen. Like a couple of years ago in iOS 14 when the home screen got a facelift and added widgets. The first key feature is that you can now have multiple lock screens. Long press on your lock screen and you can swipe right. You'll now see a plus button. Hit that and you'll see a new wallpaper picker screen. From here you can pick from photos, built in images from Apple and even new animated wallpapers. There are options for things like weather, astronomy, emoji, and more. The weather and astronomy are some of my favorites. Weather gives you imagery of what it's like outside. This could be something like a nice sunny day or a chilly rainy night. Astronomy gives you a few different options like the Earth, the Moon, and our solar system. When you unlock your phone with one of these applied, you will get a beautiful animation. On the Earth one, there is a green dot displayed to show you your location. If you're a big traveler, this is kind of a cool feature. When you apply these images as the wallpaper, it asks if you want to set them as a pair. This will then set the home screen wallpaper to be tied to the lock screen. You can go into settings, wallpaper, and customize the home screen image if you want. You can choose between the original background, a color, gradient, or a different photo. For color and gradient options, you can choose a color to base it off of. If you use a photo, you can turn on a blur effect that makes the home screen icons and the widgets pop. Like I mentioned, you can have multiple lock screens, so you can do this process multiple times. This way you can use different imagery for your backgrounds. To switch lock screens and wallpaper pairs, just long press on the lock screen and swipe through your different options. Outside of the built-in animated wallpapers, I really like the photo shuffle option. This lets you pick from a group of photos and set a time interval that they shuffle between. I selected a bunch of photos that I've taken, most of which are available in my wallpaper pack, link in the description. Then I set the shuffle counter to every hour. This way I'm constantly seeing a different photo on the lock screen and home screen. In the customization screen for photo shuffle, there is an icon in the bottom left corner. In here you can select images to remove or you can add new images to the photo shuffle. You can also tap on the image if you would like to cycle through the album. When enabling certain photos you'll see a new depth effect. In these cases the iPhone is actually separating out the elements in your photo and applying certain parts of the photo on top of the clock. This is a really cool effect. Now if you don't like it you can turn it off in the menu under customization. Now, these photos can be taken with any camera. They don't just have to be iPhone images. Some of my photos that I've taken with my Canon cameras have this effect. If the image will cover up too much of the clock or if there's nothing to apply on top of that area, this effect will not be applied. On the customization page, tap the clock to customize the font and color. There are eight different fonts to pick from. And there's also a whole host of colors to pick from. If you scroll to the end, you'll actually get a color picker, meaning you can set the typeface on the lock screen to be any color you want. This should get interesting. Between the fonts and a color picker, Apple is diving hard into user customization. Font and color isn't the only kind of theming you can do. On the customization page, you can swipe between different themes. This includes natural, black and white, duotone, and color wash. For duotone and color wash, you can pick a style color. This shifts the lock screen background in favor of that color. Personally, I just prefer natural. The next piece to the lock screen is widgets, and I am so excited for these. At their best, they are glanceable pieces of information. In other cases though, they are launchers for frequently used apps and even shortcuts. When adding a widget, be on the lock screen customization page and tap on the area under the clock. You'll then see the widget picker. By the time iOS 16 is out and apps have updated, this will be a mix of first and third party apps. When adding a widget, you'll see different options for different sizes and different information displayed. The lock screen can hold two of the large widgets, four of the small widgets, or a combo of one large and two small widgets. Most of these widgets will look very familiar to Apple Watch users. They're based on the same technology stack as watch complications. One change I would like to see in the future though is to add another row of widgets. Especially on the big iPhone, there's space. 
There are a couple of first party lock screen widgets that I really like. The first being reminders. This is just a large widget, but you can configure it to show you different views of tasks. This could be today's reminders or a project you're working on. The activity and weather are great examples of small widgets. Both of them display a lot of information given their size. There is a battery widget to show you the status of connected devices like AirPods and an Apple Watch. There will of course be a whole host of third party widgets and I'll make a video about apps that take advantage of iOS 16 in the future. But in this video I wanted to point out a couple of these apps that stand out to me. The first being Launcher. Launcher is an app that launches other apps, tasks, URLs, and even shortcuts. Shortcuts doesn't have a lock screen widget for some reason. With Launcher though, I was able to set up a button that starts airplaying a podcast in my office to my HomePods, which is something I do a lot. Having this right on my lock screen is a game changer for me. The other is the camera app, Obscura. This is a camera app that gives you manual control over taking photos and shoots raw images. This is my preferred camera app. With their lock screen widget, I'm able to jump right into the app just like with the camera button in the bottom of the lock screen. This way I can start taking photos even faster. The third app being Timery. Timery is my time tracking app I use. It's being updated to show the project time that's being tracked right on the lock screen. It also has the ability to start a timer right from the lock screen. In typical Timery fashion, they're extremely customizable. If you use any of these widgets, it will automatically turn off that depth effect to the wallpaper I spoke about earlier. I get why, as legibility becomes more important than a neat effect at this point. You can also place a widget above the clock where the date is. These widgets are designed to blend in with the date bar. When adding one, you get a compact date design. There are two widgets that I think make a lot of sense to me in this position, weather and calendar. Personally, calendar is my favorite out of the two. This will show your next appointment and at what time it's at. You can configure it to only show certain calendars if you wish. Weather is also good if you run out of slots in the section below. Widgets are the thing I am most excited about for the lock screen changes. The notification presentation got some small changes as well. Notifications can now live at the bottom of the screen. Personally, I really like this change and it makes a lot of sense. The top half of the display is for displaying static information from widgets and the clock. And the bottom half is for dynamic information from notifications. Now there are three different ways notifications will be displayed. You can change this in settings, notification. The default one is my favorite, and that is stack. This condenses all of your notifications into a, well, stack. You can tap on it and they become fanned out so you can see all of the details. Another option is list. The notifications are fanned out but are in groups based on the app. This is just like the uncompressed fanned out version of stack. The final option is count. This one is for all the minimalist aesthetic folks. This will just show you a count of how many notifications you have. You can tap on the count or swipe up to see the details of the notifications. Live activities is a feature that is coming to third parties later, but you can see it in a couple of first party apps now. Live activities are notifications that can be updated in real time. So there's a couple of examples of these, and the one that's most recognizable is the now playing notification for music. This now lives at the bottom with the other notifications. It's fairly similar to the now playing screen you would see in iOS 15 with two notable exceptions. First, there is a waveform on the notification. Next is if you tap on the artwork, it actually gets pulled out of the notification and takes up the middle of the display. The background also shifts to a gradient to match the artwork. The other live activity you can use today is with the timer app. Ask Siri to set a timer or use the clock app. You'll now see a live countdown right on the lock screen. My one complaint about this is you will only see this notification for timers that were set with the iPhone, which still doesn't support multiple timers for some reason. It would be great if it also displayed this notification for timers on the watch. What I'm excited about the most for live activities is that apps that send a bunch of push notifications for something like physical deliveries will now only need to send one notification and it can update to show the current status live. This video is sponsored by PDF Expert. PDF Expert is one of my favorite apps and I used to use it every single day back in my IT career. 
This is a full featured PDF markup and file management application. It's free to download and to try out, and honestly, some of its best features are completely free. This includes annotating and marking up PDF documents, like adding text fields, highlighting text, and striking out text. You can also store different file formats in the app, like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, images, videos, and of course, PDFs. If you decide to pay for PDF Expert, you can get features like editing text and images that are already a part of a PDF, organizing PDF pages, customizing your favorite toolbar, encrypt and add a password to your document, filling in information and signing documents, convert PDFs to other formats like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and a reading mode for when you're reading those really long documents and eye strain starts to set in. There will also be an update to PDF Expert coming out alongside iOS 16 that adds new key features. First, there will be a lock screen widget. This is great if you need to quickly pull up a folder for travel documents or a big project you're working on. The second feature is live text for images and videos. This is great if you're a student and are recording a presentation. You can copy text that is in a video or image and paste it into your note. That is really cool. The third feature will ship alongside iPadOS 16 and that's stage manager support. PDF Expert is free to download and I encourage everyone to do so. If you decide to pay for PDF Expert, there's actually two different plans you can pick from. For $49.99 a year, you can get the iPhone and iPad app. If you decide you want to go above that and get the Mac app as well for $79.99 a year, you can get the iPhone, iPad, and Mac app, plus a few extra features. This includes OCR functionality that is only in the Mac app and priority support from a very responsive support team. I'll put a link in the description below to where you can download PDF Expert. My thanks to PDF Expert for sponsoring this video. Focus was a big feature for me in iOS 15. It's getting a lot of nice quality of life improvements. The first is when you set up a focus now, you can choose from two options for notifications you can silence notifications from or allow notifications from. The former silences notifications from just apps and people you select. The latter allows notifications from apps and people you select. So there's two different ways of configuring a focus now. This gives you a lot more control compared to what was in 15. If you pick the new silence notifications from, you don't have to go in and add a new app every time you download it or add a new contact every time you meet somebody. For my personal mode, I pick the feature silence notifications from, and then I don't add any contacts because I don't want to block anyone in this focus. I just want to block certain apps. When configuring a focus, you can now configure a lock screen to be linked to a specific focus. This is where having multiple lock screens comes in handy. What I don't like is a lock screen can only be linked to one focus. So if you have two or more focus modes and you want to link it to the same lock screen, you'll have to recreate that lock screen multiple times. For me, that means I've ended up with three very similar lock screens for work modes. Having these multiple lock screens and the ability to change them with focus means I can keep relevant widgets on the screen. That means I have things and timery on my work lock screen. And on my personal one, I have weather, activity, obscura, and the shortcut launcher from Launchpad. You can also set watch faces to be tied to a focus now. This was something I was doing with shortcuts automation last year, but it's great to see it tied into the OS now. I have a face for work, a personal face, and a fitness face. With these built right into each focus, I never have to manually switch. The big new feature that's added to focus this year is focus filters. This is a way for a focus to influence the content that is displayed in an app. For example, when I enable my work focus, this will go into calendars and turn off all of my personal calendars automatically so I only see work stuff. I use this to disable my secret calendar when I'm in my filming mode. This has stuff like embargoes and meeting dates I'm not allowed to talk about. There are other filters as well. One is for mail. This one will just show you the mail account you want and hide the others. This is great for hiding your work email on the weekends. Messages will hide message threads from people that aren't allowed to send you a notification in that focus. The favorites in your messages app though will always be visible. The Safari focus filter will give you the ability to pick a certain tab group and it'll make that one active. Then there are a couple of other system filters as well. One is for setting the appearance, either light or dark mode. The other is for turning on low battery. 
This is great if you have a travel focus, it will automatically turn on low battery so you don't have to remember. Third party apps will be able to make focus filters as well. I've seen a couple of different options so far and I'm really impressed. The first is drafts. With drafts focus filter, you can load a specific workspace or draft, pin the current draft, and even set the action list and action bar group. There's also the app focused work. This will show you a specific session. That way you can jump right to the group that your focus is tied to. This is a feature I will keep a really close eye on and see what apps get updated in the future. I'll make a video about these and other third party lock screen widgets as more apps get updated. Spotlight got a few really nice updates. You can now tap the search button that's towards the bottom to get to Spotlight. You can of course still also pull down on the screen. Spotlight now shows recommendations for different series suggestions under its app recommendations. These recommendations have been spot on for me over the beta period. They can be different things like calendar events, people to call, or messages, resuming audio playback, and more. There are of course third party recommendations as well. I get a lot of recommendations for opening specific craft documents I work in a lot. One thing I noticed about Spotlight is it's now significantly faster at running shortcuts. This is a very welcomed update. There are a few system changes to iOS. One of my favorite is haptic feedback for the keyboard. Haptic feedback gives you little vibrations when you type on the keyboard. It simulates typing on a physical keyboard. Viewers of this channel know I like my clicky keyboards, so any feedback I can get while typing is welcomed. To enable this, go into settings, sounds and haptics, keyboard feedback, and turn on haptic. While this may not be something everyone likes, I do encourage you all to try it out. I think it's a really great feature. Another new feature you may have already noticed is the return of the battery percentage in the menu bar. I'm of mixed feelings about this. While it's cool to have the extra data point right there, I use a Pro Max phone and never run out of battery life in the middle of the day. If you don't like this, you can turn it off by going into settings, battery. A nice touch is when the battery gets low, it turns red, when it's in low power mode, it turns yellow, and when it's charging, it turns green. The next system feature doesn't really have anything to do with iOS, but it's AirPods. If you have AirPods that support spatial audio, when you pair them, you'll see an option to create a custom spatial audio profile. You'll hold your phone up, point it at your ears, and it will scan your ears to make a custom audio profile. This is just cool, and honestly, it sounds really good. Live text was a great feature in iOS 15. It allowed you to copy text right out of an image in apps like Photos. This year, third parties are getting access to the API, so you'll be seeing apps get updated with that support for it as well. They are also adding support for video, so you can copy text right out of a video in iOS 16 and paste it wherever you want. There's also built-in currency, measurement, and weather conversions now. So if I'm telling somebody that uses Celsius that it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit here, they can convert it right in the OS. Same thing with currency and measurements. Messages got a lot of finally updates. After sending a message, you can edit it now. Long press on a message and select edit. This option is only available for 15 minutes after sending the message. Next is undo a send. We've all sent messages we probably shouldn't have. Now you can quickly delete them. The trick is to do this before the recipient sees it though. The last feature is to recover deleted messages. Select edit, show recently deleted, and select the threads you want to recover. But be warned, after 30 days in the deleted area, the thread will be gone forever. Dictation got a major overhaul. I dictate most of my messages because I'm a terrible speller. Does that make me a dictator? Dictation works ridiculously fast now. It also has auto punctuation, so it should add commas and periods in the right spot for you. Though I have noticed it will sometimes insert a random comma if I pause too long. But that's okay, because while you're dictating, the keyboard stays open now. You can scroll back and make any changes you need to, or you can just keep typing while Dictate is on. After a while, if you aren't talking, Dictate will turn off automatically. When dictating, you can now insert emoji. That's pretty thumbs up.
For the first year since Apple released Shortcuts, the app isn't receiving any major design overhauls, and I am so happy about that. Instead, effort was put into creating and modernizing first-party actions for their apps. This includes things like rich text support for their Notes app. I'm going to do a whole video about what's new in Shortcuts this year, but in this video, I want to focus on one thing, and that is the new App Shortcuts. App Shortcuts are shortcuts made by app developers that will automatically show up in the Shortcuts app after installing or updating third-party apps. You can get to them by scrolling to the very bottom of the Shortcuts app. I'm very excited to see these because I suspect they will encourage new people to try out Shortcuts. Far too often I hear from people that open the Shortcuts app and don't have any idea what it's for. Now when they open it, they should see a list of pre-made shortcuts for apps that they use. Developers design these shortcuts, and they can do it for their most popular interactions. So for drafts, that's create a new draft. For focused work, that could be start a new session. For parcel, that could be track a delivery. But of course they can go deep as well. What makes all of these great is they hook right into Siri, just like the rest of your shortcuts. This is a way to make Siri so much more powerful while hooking into apps you have installed. I'm very excited to see these roll out to more third-party apps as apps start to get updated. I'll have even more to say about this in my shortcuts video. Photos is getting a ton of cool updates. The biggest one is finally there will be a way to have a shared photo library with your family. This won't be in the initial iOS 16 as the next updates for macOS and iPadOS aren't out yet and all devices will need to be in sync for this. When in a photo, you can now long press on it to pull out a subject. You can then drag and drop it into other apps like messages or even better, photo editing apps. Speaking of photo editing, you can now copy and paste edits you make to a photo. This is great if you have multiple photos from the same area so you don't have to manually make those changes to every single photo. When cropping a photo, there is now a wallpaper crop option. This will cut your photo down to be the perfect size for your iPhone wallpaper. The Home app got a massive facelift. First of all, all the room pages are now gone. There is just one main page for each home in your Home app. I love this change. Having a whole page for a few different devices in each room never made a lot of sense to me. At the top of the home app, there are now categories for different devices you have. Stuff like climate, lights, security, speakers, and TV. You can tap on each of these to filter to just those devices. If you have cameras in your home app, you can now see a live preview of them right from the main screen. Just tap on them to see the full screen view. You can have up to four cameras in this main section of the home app. Under the camera view is now all of the scenes and rooms. Tap on one to see everything that's in it. This layout is so much better than the previous one and it's faster to navigate. FaceTime got some cool updates. First, if you go into settings, FaceTime, turn on live captions, this will turn on text captions for your call. So cool. This is labeled as a beta feature, but it's been working okay so far. The next feature is you can use Siri to hang up a call. Just say, hey Siri, hang up. Obviously the person on the other end will hear that, but hey, maybe you want to make a point. Later when iPadOS and macOS are updated, you'll actually be able to hand off the call to other computers mid-conversation. I've done this a few times in the beta, and as far as I'm aware, the person on the other end had no idea iPadOS 16 is being released later in the fall, and I'm saving most of the productivity features and app updates for my iPadOS 16 walkthrough. I figured they just made more sense in that video. But there are a few productivity features that are coming to the iPhone I want to highlight here. First is you can now pin tabs in Safari. Just long press on the URL bar and select pen tab. This sticks all of your pen tabs up at the top so you can find them in your sea of windows. If you do what I do a lot and close all of your tabs, this will leave your pen tabs there and not close them. Notes on iOS got one of my favorite features from iPadOS last year, and that is Quick Note. You can now add Quick Note to Control Center by going into Settings, Control Center, and hitting the plus next to Quick Note. Anywhere in the OS, you can swipe down to get Control Center, select Quick Note, and start writing a new note from there. 
Just like on the iPad, you can attach what is on the screen of your iPhone to the Quick Note. This can be a web page, email, something from an RSS reader, whatever. What is missing though is the ability to swipe between other Quick Notes. On the iPad, you can swipe between them, but you can't do that on iOS, and I find that peculiar. Overall, I'm really happy to see Quick Note come to the iPhone. Maps got a few features, but one in particular that I'm really excited to show you is multi-stop routing. Now, when starting a trip, you could add multiple points. For example, we're planning a family trip to Disneyland. We can plan our route from home to Disneyland, but we can also add a detour, say Hollywood Boulevard, on our way down. I really like this because it lets me plan out a whole drive when I take a trip, especially if I want to stop at a tourist trap and get a treat. Health got some major updates, but I don't feel particularly qualified to talk about all of them. But there is one that jumps out, and that is medication reminders. I take meds twice a day, and I have been using the app Do for years for this. The way the Health app works is it lets you add in the medication you are taking, how much, and when you need to take them. It will then remind you when you need to take your meds. You can mark them as taken, and it will log that information for you. In the US right now, it will take a look at the medication you enter and give you information if that medication can't be mixed with others. This is pretty cool and potentially life-saving. So that is iOS 16. It's all about customization and I'm really excited about that. My thanks to PDF Expert for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you all so much for watching and have a great day.